the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, our Good Shepherd, speak. Help us to hear your voice, to recognize it as your voice, and then joyfully to follow thee. Help us to find the contentment, the abundance, the security in being able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. There is one who stands in our midst this morning. And he says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own. And my own know me. The intimacy of that. He says in the same chapter, my sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice. I know them. They know me, they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. I I think about Mary at the tomb when she didn't recognize Jesus, thinking him to be the gardener, until he spoke her name. And then she said, oh my. Who is it in your life? Maybe they're gone. Maybe they're before the Lord in heaven. But who is it in your life that when they said your name, there was nobody who said your name like that? I've got three people who refer to me as Pop. Nobody says Pop like those three. And it's usually preceded or followed by Nana. (laughs) My mom, Boston accent, New England. (laughs) Bowery? Nobody quite said it that way. My sheep hear my voice. Where do you hear the voice of the shepherd? For many, it's in music. For many, it's in in the word that's being read. By the way, you've got a pretty decent voice. You ought to look for a vocation in something to do with speaking. Okay. But where do you hear the voice of the Good Shepherd? In music? In the word being read? In this beautiful sacrament? When you hear the words, this is my body for you? Psalm 23, it is a place that many of us have heard the voice of the Good Shepherd at various times in our life. It's made up of 118 words, 118 words. It has this poetic flow to it. The imagery is so vivid. In 118 words, it captures so much of life, our life. There is such security, such calmness in it. As we journey through this psalm this morning, we will do so layer by layer. There will be times I'm going to ask the women to read, and then times I'm going to ask the men and all of us. But in layering this, I pray that you might be able to enjoy the fragrance of the many layers of beauty and of life and of breath that are in this psalm. So let's begin. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord. Not just any Lord. The Lord. And it's interesting that in the Hebrew here, the Hebrew word for for Lord is literally one who shepherds, one who cares for, one who protects, one who knows you intimately. The Lord, the one, the only, there is no other. The Lord is my shepherd, and just circle that word, my. Not just any shepherd, not just the shepherd. He is my shepherd. He is mine, I am his. He is mine, I am his. Do you hear what's, that, what's being declared in that? There is such dependency, and yet there's such ownership. 
shepherds would often brand their sheep, mark their sheep, so that in a mixed flock you would know, these are mine. And sometimes they would cut out just a little piece of the ear in a unique way, or sometimes they would brand them with paint or with a burning brand. But in some way they would be marked. And so are you. You are branded. You are marked. I love to ask people about their tattoos when I see them. I, I'm fascinated by what, what caused you to choose this? What caused you to choose this? And if they ask me, are, do you have a tattoo? I say, kind of. They say, what do you mean, kind of? I said, well, I'm, I'm branded. I'm marked. How? I said, by the cross. You see, you and I are marked. He has redeemed me with holy, precious blood that I might be his, what? His own. That I might be his own. But that comes at a price, does it not? This branding, this marking of us with the cross? The first mark that was made on you in your baptism was the sign of the cross. I'm his. He's mine. But it comes at a price. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone our own way. But he has laid on him, the good shepherd, he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. Next. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I want for nothing. When you can say that the Lord is your shepherd, what else do you need? It is the root of contentment, but how elusive contentment is in our society. How hard it is to learn how to be satisfied to say, enough. I've told the story so many times that when a friend of ours from Tanzania, Pastor Masami, came up to visit us in our home before he left, my wife and I, we took him to Goodwill so he could bring back as much clothes as possible to his family in Africa. And we got clothes for his daughters and clothes for his wife, and we got him a suit. His pockets were still sewn. And we were standing in line, and I said, Unity, I said, let's get a tie for that suit. He said, no, Pastor Bowie. He says, I, uh, I don't need a tie. I waited a couple of minutes to be polite, but having my mother in me, I said, Unity, how about getting a tie for the suit? He said, no, Pastor, having my father in me, I waited a couple of minutes. I said, unity. I said, how about this tie? <laughs> it's what he said next. He says, Pastor Bowie, he says, I've learned that if I reach for things I don't need, that I'm not content with what I have. I said, okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want what do I need to do to be spiritually healthy, vibrant? What do I need to do to have that abundant life that Jesus came to bring? And part of the answer is to eliminate hurry in your life. We're all busy. There's nobody here in this, this, this sanctuary that is not busy. But because you're busy doesn't mean you have to be hurried. Busy is an outward thing external thing hurriedness is an inward thing that when i'm feeling hurried chris you and i may be talking but if i'm hurried you know i'm not in the space with you i'm told that when i dismiss somebody when i'm letting it know that i want to move on if you hear me saying okay okay it means we're done <laughs> If we can help to eliminate the hurriedness within, then we are more apt to be fully present, to dwell, to abide with the shepherd, to love him, to enjoy him, to be blessed by him. And that's what leads us to the next statement. Would you read it with me? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Did you know the sheep need to be made to lie down? He makes me to lie down. He makes me. Sheep are, are, are so stubborn, so helpless, and at times so dumb, that the only way they will rest 
is for the shepherd to push them down on the middle of their back to get them to lay down. Because they won't do it on their own. And we shake our heads and we think, how, how, how silly. <laughs> but are we not the same way? That we become so busy, so full of our own schedule, that we have to sometimes be made to lie down. Where in your life, talk about this maybe at lunch today, where in your life has there been a time that God disrupted your routine by making you lie down? Maybe it wasn't in green pastures. Maybe it was in sterile white of a hospital. Or maybe it wasn't being laid off. Or maybe you fill in the blank. But there are times that the Lord says, you've got to stop. The next one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Sheep need still waters to drink. They will not drink from a bubbling brook. They're too jittery. Our beloved cat, Kiva, just passed over. We had it for about, well, we, we, cat, we were cat-sitting for Kiva for the last uh, 11 years. <laughs> it's a long story. It's true. But when you gave water to Kiva, we had one of those self-bubbler things. She would not drink until it stopped. She was too jittery, too nervous with it. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. We need stillness in our life because our, our, our lives are f surrounded by noise and externally and internally. Our soul needs stillness in order for us to stand before God. Psalm 46, be still and be still. Stop striving. Stop being anxious. Just quietly pause and know who I am. Know that I'm God and you're not. Know that I'm God and you don't have to be. There is this stillness before God that invites us to set our striving our anxieties aside and to just enjoy the moments of being known, being loved, being served. Where is that stillness, that quiet for you? Stillness and solitude are one of the most important disciplines for the child of God to, to experience. Jesus practiced this regularly. It is here in the sacrament that he says to you, just be still. Stop striving to prove yourself. Stop striving with your to-do list and just rest in what I've done for you here in body and blood. Ladies, would you read the next, which ends with he restores my soul. Ladies, together, the Lord. He restores my soul. What does this mean? You are a woman. You are a man. But you both are a living soul. And God breathed into man and he became a living soul. And souls need to be restored. Souls need to be refreshed. Psalm 43, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I will yet praise him again as my Savior and God. Why are you cast down on my soul? Cast down is shepherding talk. Cast down is what happens when a sheep falls on its back with its feet up in the air, and it will die. It will die unless someone helps to lift it back on its feet. That's what it means to be cast down. That, as a result, the shepherd had to constantly be searching and watching for sheep. Not only if they wandered away, but if they became cast down. Psalm 56, you have delivered my soul from death. You have delivered my feet from falling, that I might walk before God in the light of life. Where and when in your life have you been cast down? Where was your soul cast down? That without his gracious lifting you up, you would have died and withered away. When you come to the sacrament this day, 
remember that moment and give thanks to him for that. Men, would you read the next, please? The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sheep are creatures of habit, kind of like you and me. They keep following the same trails of the sheep before them. And if one took a left, they go left. If one took a right, this is kind of how the roads of Pittsburgh were developed. <laughs> they go along the ruts. But those ruts aren't always safe. He leads me on the paths of righteousness, the right path, the safe path. All this he does for his name's sake. I find tremendous, this, this is one of my favorite parts of the psalm. All this he does for his name's sake. He has placed his name upon you in baptism, yes? I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. In Ezekiel 36, verse 22, God says, I will redeem and deliver you, but I'm not doing this for your sake. I'm doing this for the sake of my name that I've put upon you. I'm doing this for the sake of my name. If there's a moment in your life when you think that God won't hear you because you've been such a slouch, and you continually go down the same ruts, then go to God and say, if you won't do it for my name, remember, your name's on me. And there lies the hope and the promise that what God does for you, he does for his name's sake. He's made a promise that he won't turn back on. He won't abandon you. We talked about this last week with the soul in the grave. Then together, please, the next. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He permits me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Even so with my soul. He leads me beside the righteousness name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Shepherds would lead the sheep to higher ground, but to get to higher ground, the path became very dangerous because behind rocks and behind boulders, there would be robbers and thieves and the like, or bears or lions or tigers. Oh, okay, no, I won't do that. But seriously, it was a dangerous path. So this valley of the shadow of death is, is just all that. And so he leads us through some of the most dangerous times of our life. And for a lot of us, we know that the valley of the shadow of death, specifically grief and death, can be one of the most dangerous, fearsome things. C.S. Lewis, when he lost his beloved wife, said, I never knew that grief felt so much like being afraid. But I wasn't sure what I was afraid of. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod, your staff. Yes, your discipline, your word, your promises. But your staff, your grace, your, they comfort me. You don't abandon me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. You prepare a table before me in the, the face of my, my enemies. There would be this plateau that the shepherd would lead the sheep to on a higher level. It, would call, it was called a mesa. But the shepherd would go ahead to make sure that the mesa was suitable he would prepare the table, and what that meant is he would make sure that there was salt there for the, for the sheep and that there were proper minerals for them to feed on. 
that he would get rid of the poisonous weeds. He would clear up the watering holes. He's preparing the mesa, the table before them. And this is what the Good Shepherd does for us. Not just for heaven when we get there someday, but for today. He prepares the table. He prepares the table in the presence of our enemies. Can you imagine how Satan and his demons just gnaw their teeth and groan when we come to this table? Because they can only watch as we feast, as we unite. And as we hear the voice of the shepherd, take it and eat. He anoints my head with oil. <laughs> Sheep need oil for a couple of reasons. One, insects and flies would land on their nose, but if you're a sheep, how do you get them off? <laughs> and the oil would help repel them. But oil could also be very, it could be salve. It could be comforting, soothing salve for wounds and, 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 and burns. You anoint my head with oil to keep me from frustration, to bring healing and soothing to me. And is this not what he does with us, with his word, with his sacrament? He anoints us with oil, the oil of the spirit. He has anointed you. He has anointed me by his spirit. And in anointing us with his spirit, he fills us with love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and self-control. I don't know why we don't pray to the Spirit more than we do. To anoint us in the day that lies ahead, especially when we know it's going to be a frustrating day. And finally, that last line in the, the last part. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word follow, that's not the best translation. The best translation would be, surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. When we get home, our little doggy, Mallory, will greet us. I'll go to one room, Andy will go to another room. Mallory wants nothing to do with me but she will pursue Andy wherever she goes. It's not just follow, it's pursuit. Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me. His grace is going to pursue you wherever you go this day. He will not, he, he, he will not relent. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? If I go to the heights, you're there. If I go to the depths, you're there. I've always thought that this psalmist thought God was a pain in the neck. I can't go anywhere that you don't go. And then in the end, he realizes the blessing therein. When you're lost, when you're wounded, when you're drifting, his goodness, his mercy will hunt you down. Or apply that to the prodigal in your life. Ask God to hold to his promise that his goodness and mercy will pursue the one you love that has drifted away. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We always think about that being heaven, yes? But think of it in this way. When Jesus destroys, the, when Jesus is, is before the Pharisees, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. What temple is he talking about? Himself, right? Jesus is the house of the Father. He is the temple of the Father. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in Jesus, and Jesus will dwell in me, because I am his and he is mine. There was an actor known for many movies and Shakespeare and Broadway plays who came back to his hometown, and he recited one, one speech after another and one song after another and pieces from different movies and Broadway plays, and everybody went crazy in the hometown. And he asked if anybody had a request, and there sitting in the crowd was his old retired pastor sitting in a wheelchair and he said would you recite the 23rd song and this actor said I will do that as long as you pastor recite it after me and so the actor did a marvelous job with enunciation and, and great emphasis and voice inflection 
and then the, the retired pastor came up before the crowd and with a very weak, trembling, feeble voice, he started to say, the Lord is my shepherd. And when he was done, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And the actor recognized what the difference was. The actor said to the crowd, what you saw this day is evidence of this. I know the 23rd Psalm, but your pastor knows the Good Shepherd. Do you know the Good Shepherd? Who he is to you this day in Jesus Christ. Amen.